Hello, this is Dr. Garrett Castleberry, Associate Professor and Program Director of Communication Media and Ethics at Mid-America Christian University. I'm here as part of our interview series, Incom 5113, Global Marketing and Strategic Networking. Uh, this week, we are excited to host uh, someone of an authority, at least for our purposes, on a book that we've been working through and, and dissecting in this class, Edward T. Hall's The Hidden Dimension, a kind of modern classic in certain ways, a cross-disciplinary uh, reflection on change um, and several themes, including time and others that we hope to get into uh, with our guest, guest speaker today. Uh, we are joined by uh, Dr. Eric Mark Kramer, who is the Presidential Professor of Communication at the University of Oklahoma, uh, where he also serves as an affiliate professor of film and media studies, as well as an affiliate professor of international and area studies. Dr. Kramer has a vast um, background in research and scholarship in a number of directions, um, but with special interest in uh, international communication, intercultural communication, cross-cultural communication. And uh, through his years of teaching, but also research, he's uh, developed um, that wide body of scholarship, um, advised uh, dozens and dozens of uh, doctoral students, and um, been a committed member of the O. You community. Uh, he has, uh, he's in an exciting place of transitioning. Uh, he's all the rage, and uh, universities around the globe are, are you know, fighting and, and entering combat uh, uh, politically for his, uh, for his attention, right? And so we're excited to get some of that attention today. Uh, Dr. Kramer, thank you for taking some time out of your schedule to join us to talk about. Edward T. Hall's The Hidden Dimension. If you nice will, to be here. Yeah, thank you. Tell us, a, give us a, a brief background, uh, perhaps a few of those details I skimmed over uh, about yourself and uh, perhaps your calling or maybe the point in which you intersected with, with Hall's work among some of his contemporary thinkers. Uh, well, uh, I grew up in Ohio and uh, I studied sociology and philosophy all the way through the master's level. And then I switched to telecommunications at the doctoral level. So I bring a lot of baggage with me from sociology and philosophy into the study of communications. Uh, and I've also traveled a lot and taught in various places, taught and studied in places like uh, Italy, Japan, Taiwan, Germany, England, Canada, Mexico. <clears throat> and so uh, I became very interested in, in uh, being a global citizen and what that means uh, and looking at the problems of people miscommunicating with each other. Uh, and I remember, I'm old enough to remember when there was no internet uh, <laughs> and how that has changed things dramatically. Um, so my area has always been international communications. Uh, I'm the uh, editor of the, uh, the Research Encyclopedia of International Communications for Oxford University Press. Um, and I've written books and articles and edited journals and things like that over the years. So uh, let's get into Edward T. Hall. Enough about me, too much about me. Uh, we're here to talk about Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with with Hall in mind in this book, uh, and, and to my understanding, you've you've taught with this with this book in the past as well. What what goals do you sense Hall had in mind when compiling this book? Uh, often, um, manuscripts could take on a few different forms. They could be a single focused project for a scholar um, that that really is part of a large project in mind. Or we often see many manuscripts that are that are kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of, of varying uh, projects and ideas over several years that they kind of uh, sm smatter together, right? <laughs> to, yeah. to, to put out as a whole work. 
And um, based on your understanding, what what's his what's his um, kind of inclination to to be working on the hidden dimen dimension? Well, I think Hall uh, he famously was a an extension agent for the U.S. government in the 1930s during the Great Depression, and he was tasked with helping uh, folks uh, on uh, reservations in New Mexico, um, Hopi and uh, Navajo. And his job was basically to get money into their economy by hiring locals to do engineering projects, little things like build bridges and, and things like that on the reservation that would allow money to flow in. Uh, and he discovered very quickly that uh, he had made assumptions about time and space, uh, work and relationships that uh, the Hopi and the Navajo did not share. Uh, and this then uh, was sort of an epiphany for him. <clears throat> and he began to, I think, look at research by people like J.T. Frazier and Patrick Geddes and Lewis Mumford and many others. Uh, uh, and he started, he, he was sort of contemporary with McLuhan and Enos and Ong and others who were looking at time and space and how they are uh, configured through communication and how they affect relationships. So for instance, when he got out there, he, he uh, met with the, the local folks and he said, okay, I'm here and we need to build some bridges over some gullies uh, where you have washouts um, and you know um, flash flooding on the reservation. So uh, I need X number of men to help me do this project. And they stepped forward and he said, okay, I'll meet you back here tomorrow and we'll begin. I'll show you the plans for the bridges. They're fairly simple bridges, just wooden bridges that will build and uh, improve the community. And you'll get salary for this, uh, which is of course a great motivation. So he showed up, he started working with them. And after about a week where he had finally sort of, uh, they had formed a relationship with the workers and he, he was uh, delegating uh, labor and teaching them uh, how they how the plans would work and, and how they would build the bridge. The next week he showed up and there was a completely new bunch of guys there. And he said, where's my workers and who are you guys? And they said, well, it's our turn. They said, what do you mean our turn? And they said, well, we want to share the money. <laughs> and he said, but I spent a week training these other guys up and explaining to them what our project is and they said okay well tell us so he, he began to realize that there's a big difference between collectivism and individualism these were very collectivistic peoples uh not just a, a, a small group of people were going to get all of the money instead they had they had already assumed that everyone would participate and everybody would get some of the money and the bridges would eventually get finished. He also noticed that a lot of projects on the reservation were half finished, half finished houses, half finished roads. Uh, and he asked people, locals, what's, what's going on? They said, well, we just got tired of working on it, so we quit. And this was another assumption he had as a white Anglo-American that you finish what you start. Uh, and instead, they had a different concept of time and a different concept of maturation, which is a temporal concept. His idea was you start something, you finish it before you move on to the next thing. That's not how they were thinking at all. They had what he would later call a more organic sense of time that the corn ripens when it ripens. The corn doesn't care about the clock you know, or calendars. Uh, and that's how they saw life. Uh, and so this perplexed him greatly. And he began to then study space and time around the world in terms of how people interrelate and how they coordinate their efforts. Uh, and he found a lot of complexities. Well, there's a there's a hidden dimension to all of this, and that's that the this is what what we're really experiencing, perhaps through through his life experiences translated into this book, is a shift into um, into a new, uh, I guess, layer of what 
theorists and economists consider call modernity, right? There, this pivot into if we're going to act as a global community, to use that word tossed around by Marshall McLuhan and, and others, um, then we uh, then we have to be able to function or operate in in unison. And so what what we're really getting through the story is a tension between not, not just tensions between cultures, but tensions between cultural expectations, tensions between old world ways of living and new world expectations if if we're going to progress forward. And I definitely think that what we saw in the 20th century was this, you know, the entire uh, this uh, this hundred year span was about rapid development, right? And 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 many of these tensions, we don't feel, we, we don't always hear about rapid growth as a cause maybe for um, some of the tensions that led to wars in the world, but certainly the tensions of progress um, were this through line in the century that uh, that propelled us to have to not, not just either thrust forward or fall behind, but for for the this community of, of researchers to say this is a phenomenon and we must we must be disciplined in, in how we tackle and approach um, our understanding of that 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 we're not just observers but we can aid aid uh, the progress right? Right. carefully right it doesn't matter what kind of method you're using whether it's quantitative or qualitative the researcher is part of the methodology. And what, what became clear as uh, Western uh, academics and others fanned out around the globe was that they had a culture. They didn't realize they had a culture. <laughs> uh, and uh, culture is a collective sense of values, beliefs, motivations, expectations, and behavior patterns. And what people began to discover, like Hall, was that what motivates people varies from place to place. What their expectations are varies from place to place. But modernity basically was a part of imperialism. It was, it was it involved the process of colonizing the world, moving out from Europe. And uh, the assumption was that people would develop. But then in the late 20th century, some of those folks uh, in the rest of the world said, develop into what? What do you mean, develop? Are, are, you, are you implying that I'm an underdeveloped mm -hmm. being, that my civilization is somehow inferior? Well, yes, that was the implication, that progress meant that you would become more European-like. Uh, <clears throat> and so we started to see lots of conflict and problems between what... Uh, some called traditional culture and the colonial push for modernization. Uh, traditional culture, and, and we see this blowback all over the world where you end up with a kind of love-hate relationship for Western powers. On one hand, many people around the world uh, admire Western technology, education, wealth, uh, and power. But on the other hand, they they don't like it and they fear it because it's displacing traditional cultures. That means traditional right. motives and expectations and things. <clears throat> and so, for example, in, in the Afghan conflict, uh, American commanders were given literally bags of cash to take to tribal leaders uh, and give them the money with the expectation that they would then cooperate and perhaps even... Uh, uh, tell the American uh, or the Allied commanders where uh, the terrorists were hiding. Well, uh, the local tribes leaders were happy to take the cash, but they often didn't come through with you know uh, what what the uh, uh, Allies wanted, and that's because uh, the motivation was very different. Uh, they were not motivated out of money. Mm -hmm. Uh, we found that out in the Vietnam War. Uh, you, you, you know, the U.S. would not listen to France. France warned us, don't go into Vietnam. You're not going to win, blah, blah, blah. The U.S. was very arrogant. We went in anyway, uh, and it became a quagmire. And the reason why is because we could quit and go home. They were already at home. 
there was no place for them to go. So of course they were going to fight fiercely and resist all the European efforts to keep the Indo-Chinese uh, colonialism going. So we entered the post-colonial period, which is uh, really sort of the beginning of postmodernism in some ways. In, in a, in, it's postmodernism has many, many paths that it has taken. And there was this notion that to modernize, you had to westernize. That was the assumption. Can you modernize without westernizing? And that's where we are now. People are working this out. How can we remain Saudis or, or uh, uh, Vietnamese or whatever, and also have these Western cities with electricity and elevators and automobiles and all this, you know, airplanes and all this stuff uh, that is coming from the West. Uh, and when you transfer technologies, you're, you're bringing with it, with it a lot of culture. Uh, <clears throat> and so it, with the postmodern move, uh, it really began in earnest uh, because of Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt told her husband uh, who was president of the United States that uh, he should talk to Churchill about World War II. Churchill was uh, up against it. Hitler had seized the fascist Mussolini, Hitler and uh, uh, the guy in Spain, Franco, had seized all of Europe. England was the outpost, the last democracy fighting. And he was begging the United States to honor our treaties and to enter the war. And Roosevelt kept saying, I can't because American people are isolationists. They don't want to get in, into this war. And But Roosevelt understood that Churchill was right. If England fell, there would be no so-called aircraft carrier from which to launch a counterattack. So they met uh, on, on board a ship off the east coast of Canada. Uh, Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. It was, it, and U-boats were all over the place. So it was very dangerous action, but they met and Roosevelt, this became known, I think it was called the Atlantic Accord. Uh, Roosevelt met with uh, Churchill and he said, okay, uh, we'll, we'll enter the war. Uh, Pearl Harbor hadn't started yet, but he said, okay, we'll enter the war, but you have to make some concessions. And Churchill said, we can pay for the stuff later. And he said, that's not the issue. We want you to uh, divest yourself of all your colonies. And Churchill was a big imperialist. He was very proud of the English. So pride, absolutely. So this was kind of a shock to Churchill. And uh, what, what Roosevelt reminded him of was that the United States is the greatest colony on earth and it continues to be colonized by people from all over the world. But it also was the first colony to break away from a European power, as we all know, the Revolutionary War. And he said, so how can we fight this war, supposedly in defense of human rights and democracy, but continue to be imperialistic colonizers? So. We'll join the war, we'll help you defeat fascism, we'll help you save your democracy, but you have to promise to divest all of your colonies after the war. Uh, the French did the same thing. Uh, this was a huge shift. After the war, they honored their promise. And, they, they, and so after World War II, between World War II, 1945 to 1965, Dozens of new countries came into existence. They had been colonies, and suddenly they were countries, and they they had flags, and they had air you know airlines, and they had a an international voice in their uh, shortwave radio uh, around the world, uh, and so the world changed has been changing extremely fast from World War II to the present. Uh, China has, has I, was in, I was in Hong Kong in 1983, and I went into mainland China. Very few people from the outside were allowed in. And I was going around and I could still see lots of evidence of the cultural revolution, mm -hmm. uh, mansions that still had burn marks all over them and things that had not been repaired. Uh, there were very few cars. It was like North Korea. 
today it's what i think six of the 10 top cities in the world are in china and everything in my house is made in china uh, so the world is changing very very fast and one of the things that the colonizers didn't realize the europeans was that when you make contact with somebody else yes you may have um very disproportionate power in the relationship but you were being affected too mm -hmm. so for example one of the strongest uh, groups of adherence to buddhism today are in england and if you want to get some really good curry go to london uh and they're drinking the tea i mean that what motivated colonizing was the the realization that these other places have things of value. You mentioned how uh, one of the undercurrents of the of the um, the the aftermath of World War II was this dissemination of colonized areas, this this um, re relinquishing of power uh, slowly over time. And and we do understand that some of these things have to happen slowly because if if a if that if a seed change happens too fast, it de it can destabilize the entire region. We've seen this in this century, um, um, perhaps more than once, and um, and so a takeaway for me is that we don't always get that part of the celebrated narrative, and perhaps it's because the the time span um, is is too kind of uh, distilled, or maybe even that it sounds like it's a victory but a loss to people that love narratives about acquisition which is which is a colonialist mindset right it's a, it's a colonizer's mindset to 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 prioritize narratives of acquisition um which 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 kind of makes me think of like the business world today right and and, and yeah. advanced capitalism um but what let's uh along those same lines be, uh, along the lines of not hearing certain rhythms of history Hall's book has been revered in intellectual circles, but wasn't on a bestseller list. And possibly that's 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 his fault for not naming it 10 steps for better learning, you know, like yeah, 10 steps yeah. for dummies to better learning uh, how people view time and space around the globe. Right. It's all in the branding. But what what kind of reader response has this book generated in the scholarly community since its publication? Well, uh, Hall borrowed heavily from people like Siegfried Gideon, who was uh, an urban uh, architect and a historian of architecture. And he wrote a two volume work called The Eternal Present, mm. which was a homage to his teacher, John Gabeser, who wrote The Ever-Present Origin. Uh, so uh, Hall uh, owes a lot, as, as I said before, to Patrick Geddes, I'm sorry, my phone is blowing up because we're in the middle of moving. Uh, but uh, realtors and everybody's calling me all the time. So eight sports uh, agents and so on. Right? <laughs> that's right. I keep telling them I'm holding out on the Knicks. You know, I need more money. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Hull uh, took a lot of things. I mean, what happened to him out in New Mexico uh, was startling and uh, revel revelatory to him. And, and then he became a trained anthropologist. Uh, and he read all these other guys, and he was brilliant at synthesizing and simplifying a lot of things. And that's, of course, what makes a popular book. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in the process of simplification, he overlooked some very important nuances along the way. Uh, but generally speaking, his book became really uh, the origin of intercultural communications, the field uh, for us in communications. Um, and one of the things that uh, he has looked at, which is uh, density. Uh, so he looks at, he, he was inspired by a guy named Hedegger, who was a uh, uh, ornithologist and an ethologist. Uh, he uh, Hall studied birds a lot. And he studied people who studied birds a lot. And they were very interested in density. And so... Uh, in this book, I think it's this one, uh, he has, he, he does uh, a summary of Calhoun's rat studies. Uh, and uh, what he demonstrated was that 
um, modernity, one of the things it does is it tends to bring people together into dense, uh, greater densities, uh, because you have to think of the industrial revolution as a kind of version of serfdom. Mm -hmm. In the Middle Ages, the economic system was uh, primarily a barter system. Uh, and you had the castle that was sort of the center of political and economic power. And now it was surrounded by serfs. And the thing about a city is, or a castle, it can't feed itself. A city like New York or Chicago or Beijing or Sao Paulo, uh, Mexico City, they can't feed themselves. So they have to colonize the peoples around them, reaching farther and farther out. Uh, if you take the castle away and put the, the modern factory there, you have the same thing. What, what grows up around the modern factory are neighborhoods of laborers. Uh, and so uh, people left the land in the last 100, 150 years, there's been a huge shift from agrarian economics and agrarian density uh, and rural uh, life to urbanization. And that's because of folding capital, money, the money uh, market, the, the new economy, the capitalist economy. Uh, and so the kids left the farms, which was extremely difficult work, 24-7. I mean, you've got you've to you've milk Betsy on Christmas morning. <laughs> Betsy the cow doesn't know it's Christmas and doesn't care. You have to work seven days a week all the time. Well, they left and went to the cities where they could get this new thing called money, which they could exchange for anything and working, you know, in these new things called factories. I like the word that they're facts, factories. Uh, and so populations uh, rushed in and started to support this new economy and become, they were the economy, they manifested it. But then that meant housing had to change dramatically. So people left the village ethos and became urbanized and they started stacking people up in skyscrapers you know these project what we call mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that i find most interesting in uh in what Edward t hall talks about because um he's not the only one uh, many have uh, uh desmond morris for instance the great primatologist he looks at this too uh, Morris looks at it in terms of aggression. And when you have a lot of people coming together, suddenly you have the invention of the stranger. When we all lived in villages, I knew everybody from birth to death. I may not like them all, but I know them all. And it was very collectivistic. Well, suddenly with industrialization, we all rush to these urban centers where we don't know anybody. And so all of our uh, what I, you could call our organic way of socializing with each other, that's out the window. And so Morris says that we had a huge swing from a cooperative end of the pendulum to a competitive end. We all became competitors with each other and we didn't know each other. Uh, and so for instance, anthropologists have gone to villages all over the world and they've had a graduate student, that's what they're used for, uh, <laughs> to fame. <laughs> being injured or dead, laying in the path in the village. And even though it's a total weird stranger, uh, they sit back and they time it literally with a stopwatch. And they realize that within seconds, locals stop to inquire if the person needs aid. Then they've done the same studies on the streets of Paris, London, New York, and they can lay there for hours and no one will inquire whether they need help. That's why we have homeless laying all over. People just, they, they, they not only don't engage them, they try to avoid them. And that's because Morris says they're strangers to us. And so our, our comportment has changed. So we stack people up into these projects and what Hall is talking about in terms of the studies uh, is that we become very aggressive. We've got a couple of more questions and, and just a couple of more minutes and, and I'll help to, to, to wrap us back around. But you you made a connection for me in describing this this terrific uh, 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 case study of serfdom and how it operated in in the Middle Ages. And, I, and I'm thinking of even how 
migratory patterns are taking place right here in a state like Oklahoma, where we've seen the rural areas and what was what was a mainstay of uh, of cultural life, um, eco economic or not just economic change, but climatological change has has kind of forced migration, and we're seeing surges in these suburbs of our few uh, main cities in this state, and these and the and the demographics suggest it's it's the legacy you know families from these rural communities. They're moving inward. They're coming to the city where that money is, and uh, and this 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 creates these shifts and something is gained and something is lost and i think that's that's a key takeaway those are conversations about progress well speaking of takeaways if there's a core takeaway that you could point readers toward from hall's uh polemic here what's a core takeaway that you say don't miss this point that he wants to stress uh i think the there are two that hall hall is a neo-kantian and Immanuel Kant was the first person to really talk about what he called the architectonic, how, how all of our perceptions are structured through uh, temporal and spatial uh, constructs. Uh, and Hall is looking at space and time as a neo-Kantian. McLuhan did that too, Gates, all these people. And what you want to take away from this is that as our population density increases, time speeds up. Uh, and, and in emotional terms, we're still animals, you know, we're still primates, uh, but we don't have enough space. When you put animals in, a, in especially large uh, animals in restricted space with too many, uh, too many fellows around them, uh, they become nervous and anxious. Uh, and this manifests uh, as uncertainty and anxiety. And so we're seeing uh, in modern populations uh, an enormous growth uh, of use of tranquilizers. Uh, you know, uh, Neil Postman talked about that, and many people have talked about how we're we're drugging our children, uh, we're drugging ourselves because of the stress, the stress, mm-hmm. uh, the traffic jams, density of population, and density of the traffic. People trying to get someplace on time and so the temporal urgency there's a chronic sense of urgency deadline 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 i've got to pay my bills i've got to get paid i've got to get to work i can't be late so forth and so on and so the clock uh becomes uh edward t hall talks about extension transference it was a little thing he invented that people like jt frazier and others already in gapes to talk about extensively in other terms but the clock is, is, is something invented by humans. It's entered our environment. It becomes a temporal ecology. But then the clock begins to take power over us. A lot of people talk about uh, Edward T. Hall's extension transference and, they, and everybody understands extension. Extension is anything that we make like clothing, uh, our cuisine, our technologies that sort of extend out from our imaginations. Uh, Genetic engineering is now manifesting our imaginations of better people, better plants, better animals, whatever. Uh, But what they miss is the transference part. That's what they miss in, in the definition. That's very important because what he's saying is, for instance, with the clock, we saw, you know, we invented the clock, it enters our environment, Initially, we used it to reckon time so that we could get organized. It is the essence of organizational communication, the clock and the calendar. Logistics is based on this. How quickly can you move stuff around? And you know, when you're putting together an automobile with thousands and thousands of parts and all these subcontractors, all the parts have to be here at the same time so I can assemble the car. That's a huge effort logistical effort and it's very time sensitive uh, otherwise my assembly line sits there because we never got the windshields we got everything else but the windshields so this is a disaster so the thing about uh, population density and the the economy of scales and the effort to increase efficiencies that leads to temporal anxiety a chronic sense of urgency the clock we invented it it entered our 
environment, and now it judges us. So for instance, if you ask me for a letter of recommendation, and I say, well, Garrett is a really nice guy, he's very creative, but to be honest, he was always late on getting things done. Now, Joe Blow, I'm writing a letter for him too. Joe is not, he's not a poet and an artist like Garrett, but man, he gets stuff done. He never misses a deadline. And so what's happening there is a very fundamental character judgment about Garrett and Joe. Transference. That is done by the clock. You know, if, if, if I'm supposed to meet Garrett for dinner, and he's late after about 10 minutes, I start timing Garrett. And I'm like, so when he finally shows up, I'm like, Garrett, you're 47.32 seconds late. Uh, so this has led to all kinds of problems, psychological and physical maladies, things like heart failure, mm. uh, and quite possibly cancers because uh, people lay awake at night worrying about the next day and whether or not they'll be able to get their bills paid on time. If they can't, that will affect their credit rating, which in a capitalist economy is a huge judgment about you, about your character. Nobody wants to lend you money if you have a bad credit rating. Well, I have that because I missed two car payments and three house payments on time. Interest is calculated on time. Everything is so we're uh, one of the things that Lewis Mumford pointed out very brilliantly in his book, uh, Civilization, uh, uh, Techniques and Civilization, was that we have become extremely quantitative. We measure everything in quantitative terms. And once you quantify things, you can then enter them into calculations into formula so our lives are now judged by formulas uh like your credit rating things like that like your social media algorithms that that are now predetermining your next choices right and and so this this uh is causing anxiety one of the things that we're seeing for instance is that it's having an, a big impact on children uh the more kids attend to social media, the more depressed they are. Uh, and, you know, my generation likes to say, well, we were smart. We were involved in Vietnam, you know, and we were involved in uh, desegregation and we were involved in women's liberation, all this, you know, all these advances in human rights. And sometimes they will look at young people and say, well, they're just apathetic and all they do is play video games. That's not what we see in the research. What we see is that young people are very aware of major problems that they feel like they can do nothing about. Climate change, the economy, things like this. Things are getting harder and harder and they're not stupid. They see this. And so we see uh, uh, elevated levels of uh, depression uh, and things and kids are staying home. When I, when I was 18, everybody I knew couldn't wait to get away from their parents. It was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to college or I'm joining the army or whatever, but I'm getting out of here. I'm blowing this popsicle stand. You know, <laughs> it's not like that. We're seeing lots and lots of kids stay at home longer and longer. Psychologists call this uh, extension of adolescence. And the reason they are reticent to step out is because things are so hard. Uh, you're being tracked constantly. Everybody knows how much money you have or don't have. All of these things, it's, it's, uh, and you can't forget. One of the things about the internet is it doesn't let you forget. So if you look at, for instance, the Alamo in Houston, the great heroes of the Alamo, Sam Houston and that bunch, most of them were wanted criminals back east. They fled eastern cities. Some of them were really not nice guys. They were pretty rotten criminals. But they were able to come out to the new territory and become heroes because nobody knew their backstory. But today, if you have a prison record, for instance, or a DUI or whatever, that you can't 
shake it. And so in Europe, for instance, they're passing laws, the right to forget laws, uh, so that you can take mm -hmm. down websites and, and eliminate them. You know, uh, the Wayback Machine on the internet, it, it archives everything on the internet. Well, they're trying to say, no, no, uh, somebody made a mistake. They posted this stupid picture of themselves or they wrote some neo-Nazi crap when they were 17 yeah. and they're 35 now. They, they, you know, they want this. Well, it's hanging around. And so uh, there's just so much pressure uh, because of social media and things that my generation never had to deal with. I mean, if I got chased home by bullies in junior high, once I made it to my screen door, I was safe, right? <laughs> it's like baseball, yeah. slide in safe. safe. You know, they have to stay in the street and that's that. But now they go online and you can't get away. Uh, and young people are coping with things that we don't understand. All we know is that there's more and more stress and anxiety among young people. And that's one of the consequences of hyper modernity. Mm and this density. The density now is not just, well, you know, and so I'll end here by saying, uh, Edward T. Hall needs to be upgraded dramatically. One of the things that needs to be upgraded is, he's talking about physical density, but if you talk about psychic density, that's the internet. The virtual selves are packed together. So you put something out and it becomes viral. It's like being naked in the town square in the 1950s. Yeah. Only the town square, the public space now is virtual. And a lot more people have eyes on you. So what uh, is, um, how can we, how can we secure a sense of hope or optimism, right? What are the solutions that we can do? Because if we're in this global community together, what, what's a solution that Hall can help, help teach us or lean us toward? Or maybe maybe an updated read, right? A recommendation of someone who's come afterward and suggested X. The uh, basic, there are, there are some things that young people have to understand. Things are getting better. Yes, some things are getting worse, for sure. But literacy around the globe is up. Poverty around the globe is down dramatically. Life spans around the globe are, are longer now than ever. Uh, technologies are emerging that are uh, problem solutions. The problem, what the young people are going to have to do, and as they get older and people like me die and get out of the way, is they have to wrest power from older generations that basically screwed a lot of stuff up. Uh, and that's not going to be easy because there's a lot of money involved, uh, but we're seeing this happen. Uh, Elon Musk, there's a whole lot of stuff about Elon Musk I don't like, but I will give him kudos for dragging our transportation system, kicking and screaming into electrification. He did that basically single-handedly. Now GM, Toyota, Ford, all the giant companies, Mercedes-Benz, they're all rushing in behind him. There were more Super Bowl ads for electric vehicles than traditional vehicles. Right. This, this he year. made it work. He proved it could work, even though he's an outsider and a nobody in the automotive industry. Uh, and so I think that as we have, uh, as we shift uh, to younger generations, they will find solutions. Uh, and they are. And they are even profitable solutions. Elon Musk is not doing too bad. <laughs> the richest man in the world. He wants to go to Mars. You know, he restarted space uh, exploration. Why does he want, what is it? Uh, Skylink. He's putting up all those little satellites, communication satellites. He's blanketing the earth so that his, so that electric automobiles can never get lost. GPS on, on steroids, things like that. Now, a new mapping. The danger is giving that to somebody like the Chinese who will survey you and take all your privacy away. So the ultimate struggle and the ultimate hope is as we move forward that we keep pressing for democratic uh, principles of uh, privacy, 
and uh, protection of the individual um, against state power. Um, so we're, we're entering the surveillance society, it's already there, uh, but we're going to have to be vigilant about keeping this uh, under the control of people who represent the will of the population and stay, not just a handful of oligarchs. Stay vigilant, help to wrest power, but look for profitable solutions. Those are some warm takeaways. Dr. It's it, some things are getting better. Yeah. I thank There's you so much for poverty. joining us. I know we have to let you go. We're going to honor honor your your time commitments, right? The urgency, that temporal clock is yeah. ticking. The system demands that you get off this digital exchange. You must go take care of uh of these other these other folks out there in the world looking to to also punch the clock, so to speak. Yeah. Um it has been a gift to get this uh history that helps embed a richer understanding of appreciation for and, and new use value with uh, Edward T. Hall's The Hidden Dimension. Thank you again for joining us in our uh, interview series. Uh, it's been great chatting with you, and I know it's going to be enriching for our students as well in COM 5113, Global Marketing and Strategic Networking. My pleasure. All the best to you guys. Forward.